So thank you to everyone um, for joining us. As some of you may know, South Africa is going into a national shutdown and in the midst of COVID-19, we're all finding industrious ways to work from home and to self-isolate. Health advisory is no different. Um, we had hoped to have a public event for the launch of phase two of data protection in Africa, but alas, um, we're doing the best we can with the technology available to us. So with that said, uh, welcome to everyone. Six months ago, we embarked on a process to make available data protection laws uh, from around the African continent. During phase one of that process, we created fact sheets and country pages on data protection Africa for 31 African countries. And recently, and with, thankfully with the support of the Strategic Advocacy Fund, we've embarked on a phase two, which has seen further updates to the site and further resources for organizations, individuals, and data privacy activists around the continent. So Piso, um, you know, over to you, and just to, to thank you again, um, and to restate the, the amount of work that you have put into developing phase two of this project. We, we know how much time it takes to map the data privacy landscape in Africa. Um, and we're really thankful uh, for your work on this. It's, it's becoming an increasingly useful public resource. And a lot of that um, is in no small part thanks to you. So maybe then if I can ask, what in your view is the importance of data protection Africa? Thank you, Mike. Um, well, for me, Data Protection Africa is a very, very important tool, given the fact that most people still are even unaware of the fact that they exist something called data protection, that their data is supposed, they have rights to us, their data, it is supposed to be protected. So Data Protection Africa, um, I feel that it is a very important tool, particularly taking into account the fact that it is a free and it's an easily accessible tool that most people can use to educate not only themselves, but they can pass their education down. It is a tool that can even reach people who are in communities um, that are not particularly um, well aware of, of issues like data protection. Thank you. And maybe, you know, as, as the, the lead researcher on the phase two developments, what is it that we, we see in phase two? What can users of Data Protection Africa look out for? Well, um, users of Data Protection Africa can be on the lookout for the fact that all the country factions have been updated as of the 20th of March, 2020. They can also, one of the key changes as well is that the Republic of Kenya and the Togolese Republic are the latest to join the list of African countries that have enacted data protection legislation. So found through the DPA portal, a country fact sheets for the countries which contain a comprehensive um, summary of the data protection legislation in both of these countries. We have also currently um, introduced a running um, record of the recent data protection experience in Africa, as well as an overview of sub-regional data protection trends in Africa. And another thing to look out for in future is a development in relation to the Republic of Egypt as the law is still in development there. Fantastic. Thank you, Tabi. So maybe, you know, as a point of interest for, for viewers, um, do you want to take us through one of the, the recent cases, just a, a brief overview of what type of litigation we're, we're seeing on the continent? Um, well, I could take it to Kenya or I could take it closer to home. Which one do you prefer? Let's, let's go with the Kenya example. I think there's some interesting jurisprudence coming out of Kenya. It might be useful for, to inform viewers about it. Well, like um, Tina ha had mentioned about how the, the Kenyan court recently um, engaged the issue of the use of biometrics in the light of the lack of adequate regulations in Africa. So um, the decision came out, and if I'm not mistaken, at the beginning of 2020, on the, well, uh, where the court actually halted the use of um, a system that uh, includes the collection of people's biometric data without any uh, a proper um, regulations such as data protection in Africa. And this is a particularly important decision because we've come to see that there's been a trend in Africa in the increase of the use of sophisticated technology in surveillance, your biometrics, without any proper regulation. So the decision in, K in Kenya is, provides very useful guidance in terms of how 
before the implementation of any of this technology, there has to be adequate safeguards in place. Wonderful, thank you. And then maybe as a, you know, a more practical question, we know that there's a lot of students, a lot of researchers starting to engage um, in data privacy research. And someone who, who is at the coal face presently, what are some of the, the obstacles that you faced in reviewing data protection laws in Africa? And what are, do you have any tips that might be useful to other researchers who are engaging in this space? Well, I would say that some of the challenges I faced is the lack of in access to some of the information regarding data protection in Africa. You find that certain countries have had data protection for the longest, uh, for a very long time, but you find that they do not have any comprehensive sort of database that will clearly state all the cases they've dealt with, that will clearly um, indicate some of the decisions that have come from those, even if you find such um, uh, databases, you find that some of them are very outdated. So my advice to any person who's pursuing this type of research is go all out, uh, go to all, all of the resources, particularly you find that most of the resources you will find about data protection Africa are some of the papers that have been written in other jurisdictions outside Africa, like America, like Europe, they've written about African data protection, but people in Africa that have actually written or researched about data protection in Africa, there are very few. So even if you find that um, what you're trying to research is not particularly a very um a topic that it has a lot of information so that's where you can that's where you can add with your research that's where you find all these gaps and you can contribute to them perfect so to piso thank you so much for the overview and again to restate the wonderful work that you've done um in updating the site uh, for, for phase two of this process um if i can then turn to to arvani singh who's a director and founder at Alt Advisory uh, and a data privacy specialist. And Arvani, I suppose the pressing questions in the midst of, of the global pandemic that we see is what concerns should data privacy activists have in relation to sweeping measures that states are presently taking in relation to COVID-19? So I think there are three key points to keep in mind when we're dealing with COVID-19. The first is that privacy remains a fundamental right, um, and it's one that must be jealously safeguarded, particularly as we see other states starting to incur intrusions into the exercise of the right to privacy by sweeping surveillance regimes in order to track people or monitor people's behavior in order to ensure and enforce the mechanisms in response to COVID-19. But of course, the right to privacy can also be limited by a law of general application. And so even as people exercise their right to privacy in their homes, over their digital communications, and even in respect of their rights to health, um, it must be remembered that the state can require people to make appropriate disclosures, including, for example, to disclose their COVID-19 status to state authorities, um, although it's not a requirement to disclose it publicly if not uh, required or not wanted. The second is for people to make sure that in the apps, in the applications that they use, in the services that they sign up for, they're careful about things like the terms of service that are being used. This might be an opportunity for certain individuals or companies to try and harvest data, which really shouldn't be allowed during a particular period. The third is for people to be aware of the potential for cyber crimes to take place. I think this is now fertile ground, as we've seen a much speculation for people to try and hack into people's databases, to try and commit cyber crimes that shouldn't be permitted. And it's really important that people are vigilant over their privacy rights, always, but particularly during these times of heightened concern. And Arvani, you know, we, we've started to see a lot of writing come out. And I think we all appreciate that this is a global, a global pandemic that requires an international response. It's something that we, we need to get to, you know, through together. But as you correctly point out, I mean, privacy is still a fundamental human right. And we're seeing writing coming out indicating and relying on historic case studies that often measures which are implemented during times of crisis often persist into times of calm. Is there anything we should be looking out for, for the sort of regulatory creep? And what is it that data privacy activists should be monitoring during this time? to prevent these intrusions to the extent that we get through this pandemic? I think a 
the first point to make is that access to information around these measures is fundamental. So it's unclear at this stage, I think, comprehensively what measures the states, different states are considering putting in place. I think privacy activists have a fundamental role to play in ensuring that once this pandemic has passed, measures, appropriate measures are taken to restore a sense of normalcy within the public spaces. And that ranges from things like CCTV cameras or measures that the state puts in place to require disclosures. These are patently confined to the disaster management responses that states are putting in place. Some states have gone as far as declaring states of emergency, others have done it through legislation. But these, I think, are extraordinary measures that must not be allowed to persist into ordinary days. This should not be an opportunity for states to expand their surveillance capabilities or encroach into the rights of data protection without appropriate measures and safeguards being put into place and, and, and appropriate protections for the right to privacy and other fundamental rights. I think it would be fair to say that, you know, playing the right to healthcare against the right to privacy is in many ways a false narrative. In the ordinary course, all people should have an equal right to both and the interplay and the tensions between both should be managed. But in times like these, there might be measures that need to intrude into the right to privacy, which we're seeing. But I think it's, it's absolutely correct to suggest that these are solely interim measures and they should not be used to extend into times of calm, um, where ultimately that right to help and the right to privacy are pitted against one another. Would you agree? I would agree with that. But I think we must remember that the limitation of any right is also circumscribed by the Constitution and under international law it must be the least restrictive measure available. It cannot just be a nice to have or a want to for further information. Data protection requires us to make sure that the information that we collect is relevant and not excessive. And so this is not an opportunity or an open door for states to start collecting as much information as possible in light of the current crisis, which may have certain benefits, but is, does not comply with the legal frameworks, which are still in place and must still be complied with. Thank you, Albany. And I have to ask, um, it's a question on, on everyone's minds. So notwithstanding uh, COVID-19 and, and the global pandemic, uh, South Africa's Protection of Personal Information Act came into effect in 2013, um, given the substantive provisions were not entered into force and haven't yet commenced. But it's now been seven years. Have you heard of any mutterings, any discussions that are taking place about ultimately bringing all provisions of the into force? So unfortunately, it has been a frustratingly slow process to see the substantive provisions of Poppy being into force. And I think particularly at times like this, when we are in a crisis, when we want to make sure that there are proper safeguards in place, not having the appropriate legislative framework leaves quite a significant vacuum in the, in the regulatory landscape. So unfortunately, pop, the substantive provisions of Poppy are not yet in force, as you correctly noted. Earlier this year, the information regulator wrote to the presidency to say that the information regulator is ready for, the, for these provisions to be brought into force, but the presidency has not yet replied. The deadline provided by the information regulator was 1 April 2020, but I think it stands to good reason that this will not actually take place. The state has indicated that it has every intention of bringing Poppy into force, but has been unwilling to commit to a time frame. And I think this, is this raises serious concerns about the state's commitment to this piece of legislation and the recognition of how important it is in order to safeguard the rights to privacy, access to information, and the data protection rights more broadly. And I think, you know, interestingly at this time, um, the Special Rapporteur, the present Special Rapporteur on the Rights of Privacy, devoted a lot of his present tenure to medical data. And it's probably quite an interesting time now to look into some of that reporting to understand what it is that states can and can't do with medical data that's collected uh, during COVID-19. I think you're absolutely right. And I think states really need to be cautious during this time. I think like we mentioned earlier, although there's a temptation to collect as much information as possible, Medical data is patently sensitive information. It is so intrinsic to individuals. It carries with it so many social, political, economic, and other consequences for individuals. 
And this is not a free for all. We really need to be sensitive and concerned about the way in which it's collected, processed, and stored. And very importantly, what happens with that information once the crisis has passed. Thank you. Um, uh, maybe then um, to you, Tina. Um, Tina is an uh, analyst at Alt Advisory and has recently been engaged in quite extensive research around information and digital rights on the continent. Tina, what are some of the, the key and emergent themes that you're seeing coming out of Africa in the data privacy space? Thanks, Michael. I think, and as illustrated by our conversation today, it's quite clear that Africa is digitally transforming, which on the one hand is really exciting, and allows us to have these conversations and allows us to continue with the work that we're doing. And we are seeing some really positive trends. But on the other hand, and as alluded to by Arbany, there are some concerning threats that we also need to be mindful of. At this point, I think there are two key trends as well as some threats that maybe we should discuss. The first, and as DPA illustrates, is that a number of African states have enacted data protection laws and many more states are in the process of doing so. This is a really important step for the right to privacy, and it is likely that we will continue to see states developing data protection legislation. Secondly, and coupled with the rise in data protection legislation, we are seeing an increased role in these laws to facilitate trade among states. And this is largely due to the fact that many data protection laws restrict cross-border data transfers if the receiving state doesn't provide appropriate safeguards in relation to data protection. So this can have a huge economic impact on the continent, which could be really exciting for Africa. Unfortunately, and alongside these positive developments, we are also noting with concern the rise in surveillance technologies, as suggested by Avani, which are posing a serious threat to our privacy rights. We are also seeing a lot of problems around the collection and retention of biometric data as well as the illegal gathering and exploitation of data by both state and non-state actors. The Kenyan Constitutional Court has recently engaged with this, and we're also seeing more African states relying on biometric technologies during elections. So with all of these emerging opportunities and exciting ways in which Africa can develop, there is a growing creep of stresses and threats to our right to privacy. And given the current global context, and our increasing and undeniable reliance on technology, protecting and safeguarding the processing of personal information is more important now than ever, I think. Um, phase two is now online. We now have 32 comprehensive country briefs. The most recent inclusion is the Togolese Republic, and there's been a substantial revision uh, to the fact sheet on Kenya. But thanks to Tapiso, we now also have a running record of jurisprudence uh, in relation to data privacy around the continent, and equally a note on trends that we're seeing in the data protection space. Following this process, we're going to be moving into a phase three, whereby we're going to continue to keep fact sheets up to date. On present timings, we're looking to, to update fact sheets twice a year. As Tapiso has indicated, the last fact sheets are now fully available and updated to the 20th of March, 2020. 20, and we're looking to conduct the next review by early September 2020. With that said, phase three is also going to see increased functionality um, on Mobi um, or, or through mobile. And equally, we're going to be setting up a, a function whereby data privacy complaints can be submitted directly from Data Protection Africa to data protection uh, authorities and jurisdictions where they exist. So that's on the horizon. In the interim, we hope that you find the phase two developments to Data Protection Africa useful. And to everyone out there, we hope that you stay safe during this time.